Good. Well, welcome, um, Parker and, and John. I'm going to let each of you guys introduce yourselves. This is the Downtown Arlington Roots podcast series, and we are kicking it off with the history of baseball in Arlington. So um, super excited. Yeah. April 21st, that is a special day in Texas sports history. John, what happened on April 21st? Well, uh, after a extended wait due to a player's strike in 1972, the first major league regular season game was played at Arlington Stadium uh, between the Texas and the new Texas Rangers and the then California Angels. Wow. And, uh, Parker can probably uh, has some pretty good memories of his grandfather. I mean, the picture, and, and you'll, for the new ballpark in, uh, for Globe Life Field, where I'm standing now, it's very lonely here right now, of course. Uh, we have actually, uh, we have some good art uh, down in the clubs of the picture of the players with the cowboy hats. So I will let uh, Parker can elaborate a little bit on that. Well, speaking of opening day, uh, April 21, 48 years ago, a lot of people don't know that Nolan Ryan was actually on the Angels yes. at the time. So little, oh my gosh, did anyone would anyone know he would become such a Ranger icon? You know, and here he was on the opposing side of the field a long time ago. Well, so that's a big day. That's when we first played baseball here on on the ground in Arlington. But it was a whole other story before that ever happened. And, um, you know, I'd really like to kind of start at the beginning, which is really the, the where you start with any good story. You know, what, what was it that brought baseball here? And Parker, this one's definitely going to you. You know, what, what was it and when could you watch baseball and how could you watch baseball in the good old days in Arlington? Well, uh, way back when there, there was no baseball um, anywhere close to Arlington. I mean, you, you basically could pick up a, a bat and a ball in your backyard and that was about the closest you could get so my grandfather um he grew up a cardinals fan um in st louis and so him and his dad would take the no train cardinals. <laughs> cardinals, exactly. although we cardinals still don't like bad them name with us, so we don't want to hear about the cardinals no, I, know, I, yeah. lived, I lived there for four years so i learned to drink the kool-aid but i came back here as fast as i could well, he got over the Cardinals really quick. Let's just say that. Uh, but he would take the train, and that was the, the closest he could get to baseball. And so I think he just had this big dream as a kid. Why can't we have Major League Baseball right here in our backyard? So um, he just was a huge, huge lover of the game, really. And he, he went into sports broadcasting, wanted to announce um, baseball games when he got older and went to USC and Southern Cal. Um, and that was really where his love grew. So when he finally came back to Texas after being there in college, um, it really wasn't, it was General Motors that got him interested in wanting to run for mayor. His dad kind of nudged him to run. Um, then when they got General Motors, he uh, really felt emboldened um, a few years later in the late 50s, in 1958, to say, why can't we go after Major League Baseball? Why can't we have it here too? So um, when you think about baseball at the time, you had baseball in the East Coast, and that was pretty much it. You know, there, there was an exodus to, to Los Angeles and San Francisco around that same time um, when he started, started plugging for it, uh, but that was it. And so it was kind of a pipe dream. People said, you know, it, this is football country. The baseball will never come here. Um, you know, just don't even try. And that's really where it began. And there was a big push at the beginning. Um, they were going to create a third major league. It was called the Continental League. And it would have been headed by Branch Rickey, who a lot of people famously um, know, who brought in Jackie Robinson um, to break the color barrier, what, back in, what, 1948, I believe it was? John might be able to correct me on that. 47. Uh, 47? A year off. Um, so they were going to create a third major league, and it would have included the New York Mets, the, the uh, Houston with Colt 45s at the time, Minnesota Twins, Los Angeles Angels, would have included Arlington slash DFW, and that ended up imploding and uh, went nowhere. Um, he got a lot of support from Branch Rickey, but that was about it. All the other teams, cities got their teams, uh, but left Arlington out, so it was pretty crushing for him then. But it did bring about it, probably his biggest ally, um, Gene Autry, who uh, a lot of people know is the, the famous singing cowboy of the Hollywood era, 
and uh, he wrote Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. And Richard Green always um, said it so well that Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer gave Gene Autry enough money to then buy the Angels, um, which then he became Tom Vandegrift's biggest ally from the beginning. So that was a, a, a big coup to, to get him on board with his quest for Major League Baseball from the beginning. Um, and I so, want to talk about later, I'm sorry, I want yeah. to talk about later, that you mentioned Gene Autry, you know, there's been several celebrities and high profile people involved in both the ownership and um, the influencing around the stadium. So John, you, you, you can share some of those stories too. But we're going we're gonna to come back and talk about Gene Autry and George Bush and, and, and some other players that have really been tied in with, with the Rangers history. So go ahead. Um, um, well, for me, you mean? Yeah, it's, it's, and I'll just, I'll just kind of go from what, just mention what Parker's talking about, just as an overview. And I was thinking about this before uh, the, this, uh, this presentation today. It is amazing that Arlington, Texas, has become this baseball, I, I would call it a mecca. We are now on our third stadium, and, and it's due to really three mayors. Uh, Jeff Williams, who the current mayor, who was very involved in this stadium, Richard Green, who had a, you know, a ton to do with building the ballpark in Arlington, and then Tom Vandergriff, who, who started it all. It, it's an amazing story, and uh, Parker can kind of give a few more of the details getting you know, to, 90, to uh, September 1971, but it, it really is an incredible story. So Parker, one thing that I know is that your grandfather went on a trip to Anaheim, mm -hmm. partly to see baseball, but also to experience Disneyland. And he's such an entrepreneur um, that, you know, to think that that's really where a lot of this, that what, what drives Arlington came out of that visit. Can you talk a little bit about that and what, how that, how that yeah. formed what happened next? Well, he went to school in Southern Cal there. So he, um, you know, he was around Anaheim. And so he just, I mean, it, it just kind of sprouted up. And so I think him seeing that gave him a vision with Arlington, but you had Disneyland that was there and then the baseball teams that had come um, that were nearby. And so we thought, man, we could really model um, Arlington after Anaheim. And so he, what he wanted was Disneyland. And so he went to Walt Disney and tried to lobby him to build Disneyland here. And uh, Walt Disney, you know, said, no, thanks, not interested. Uh, so instead, my grandfather pulled together Angus Wynn here locally in DFW, uh, who then they went out there, um, tried to pitch him again, didn't work. And so they said, well, let's just build a park ourselves. And so uh, Angus Wynn ended up building Six Flags Over Texas, which, as we know, has become what it is today and is, you know, one of the leader in worldwide entertainment and thrill rides and everything around the world. So um, that was where that came about. So baseball really was the, the, the first building block to get Six Flags over Texas. So it's interesting how, how that happened. John, can you, can you talk about how we've come full circle with that connection between that historic time that he spent in Anaheim and, uh, and the, the new tenants, some of the new tenants you have in the, in the ballpark? In the old Globe Life, Globe Life Stadium. Oh, uh, in Globe Life Field, you mean? In Globe Life Park? Yes. Globe Life Field. Originally Globe Life Park, right? Yes, yes. Globe, Globe Life Park. Um, well, I mean, you know, it, it was a time, again, I'll, and I'll go back a little bit. I mean, obviously, you know, it, Tom Vandergriff is a, has a big influence on baseball in Arlington, and, and I will contend that Nolan Ryan is probably – in the top two or three also in having uh, an influence on baseball and its growth in Arlington. Um, in the late eighties, the Rangers were not exactly uh, a great franchise. Eddie Childs was the owner. Uh, for people that remembered, he owned the Western Company of North America, which was an oil business. When the oil glut, one of the first oil gluts, when the oil business bottomed out in the late eighties, uh, Mr. Childs didn't have a lot of money. I mean, uh, he tried to sell the team originally to a gentleman named Frank Morsani, who was from Florida, who uh, wanted to move the team to, uh, to St. Petersburg, which would have become the, uh, the Tampa Bay Rays, I guess, back in 1987. Uh, when that fell through, eventually the, they put together the deal um, to sell the team to uh, George W. Bush's group, Rusty Rose, Tom Schieffer. 
But the, the, the thing is that Eddie Childs, despite the fact of his financial situation, he was actually still the owner when we signed Nolan Ryan in December of 1988. Uh, the Bush Rose Group took over and, be, and bought the team in, uh, in April of 1989. And from there, it, it just kind of took off. Uh, over the next two or three years, attendance improved. Uh, every time Nolan pitched, we had a sellout. Of course, because of that, that the Arlington Stadium, if you remember, had 20,000 bleacher seats that were $4 a piece. So a sellout for Nolan Ryan wasn't creating a, a lot of incremental revenue for us. And at that point, we knew we needed a new stadium. Um, but the fact that we had Nolan made it, made it easier for, for Tom Schieffer and Richard Green and George Bush to create the momentum to build then the ballpark in Arlington, which opened uh, uh, in 1994. Um, and, and part of that was the office building. And, and, and in that office building, we had a number of big name tenants is what you're, you're talking about that came in very early. Uh, uh, Troy Aikman had an office in there. Uh, we had a dentist by the name of Rick Hersher that used to pitch for the New York Mets. Uh, and it was a time in Arlington where we finally had some kind of celebrity presence. A lot of that was due to, uh, to our owner, uh, who later became the 43rd president of the United States. Because of him, uh, his father was president at the time, you know, threw out the first pitch in Arlington Stadium in 1991. You know, his mother threw out several first pitches uh, in both ballparks. So we were able to kind of create the celebrity presence, you know, in those years. But it all, I mean, I will say it had a lot to do with Nolan, who ironically enough, never pitched in the ballpark in Arlington. He retired after the 1993 season, but really did put the Rangers on the map. It's definitely um, true, yeah. And, and so I was told by someone that it was really when George Bush sold the Rangers that gave him the money to run for president. Um, he, uh, he actually, the, he had actually, you know, he, he, he basically was very involved with the team on a day-to-day -day basis from 1989 to about 1993 when he ran for governor. Uh, and at that point he put his, uh, he put his interest in the team into a trust um, and they sold the team in 1998. President made a pretty good profit off his original investment, obviously, and, and I'm sure it didn't hurt. So, at least gave him the platform, at least gave him the platform to and the megaphone to, to run for governor. And it really did. And, you know, I've, I, I do some docent work at the Bush Library. It's one of my hobbies when I'm not working in baseball. And we had a baseball exhibit there about five years ago. And I, one of the big things was George Bush created his visibility when he owned the Rangers because he would, he would stump for the Rangers almost all over Texas, not just Dallas, Fort Worth, but he'd give speeches in Lubbock and Amarillo and, and places like that. And it did give him a lot of visibility around the state. So it's interesting how things come full circle. And we, we've had that tie to Washington DC from the get go, right? Um, our mayor, Tom Vandegrift, Whenever that was, 1960, I guess, is when it sort of started. Uh, started knocking on doors. Very young mayor, just yep. very determined. How many times did people tell him no and tell him he was crazy? Well, lots of lots of times. It's about it, just about everyone. But even locally, I mean, I got a letter from Tex Schramm who said, "You're absolutely crazy. What are you doing, Tex Schramm? You know, the infamous Dallas Cowboy general manager." But uh, yeah, he had, a, he had a lot of opposition. But I mean, you have. Charlie Finley of the Kansas City Athletics, who said he was going to move here. And, you know, he, to the point where he said to, to my grandfather in writing, if a word of this leaks to anybody, this whole deal blows up. It blew up anyway, and he ended up moving to Oakland. Um, they built Turnpike Stadium in the mid-60s and really galvanized minor league support in this area. And that movie, uh, Bull Durham, uh, Ron Shelton, who was an infielder for um, the Spurs, he partially gained some of his inspiration from his time here. Uh, that then led to Judge Roy Hoffines in Houston. Uh, the Houston Astros then were the only team in Texas. So you bring in another team to, to cut, you know, his empire in half um, when he built the Astrodome and all of that, that uh, he wasn't about to let that happen. So he single-handedly blockaded uh, the move from getting a National League entry in 1968. And that was crushing to everybody. Uh, then you have 1970, it was, 
uh, the Seattle pilots were floundering uh, where they were in Seattle, couldn't even pay their rent. And so my grandfather and Lamar Hunt and his team kind of stepped in and uh, they went head to head with a guy named Bud Selig, who later then became baseball commissioner. And uh, he moved the team to Milwaukee where they've become um, what they are today. So there was a lot of uh, struggles, that's for sure. Most people pretty much gave up um, and he was the last man standing and where everything kind of came to a head in Washington back in 1970, it was 1970, October 1970 is when uh, Gabe Paul of the Cleveland Indians had called him and said, you've got to come up to Cleveland. I've got to talk with you. My grandfather flew up there and he, uh, he recalled, he said it was a blasted cold winter day is what he said. In the back of a limousine, Gabe Paul told him, you've got to go for Washington. Um, you know, they're a big financial hawk. Uh, Ted Williams, the legendary Ted Williams, was manager of the Senators. You know, they were fighting to give hope to the hopeless. Um, Frank Howard, the most physically intimidated figure in the game. Lenny Randall, uh, it, it just Denny McClain, Kurt Flood, this really interesting cast of baseball characters were just a hot mess. And um, so my grandfather then called Gene Autry and said, um, this is what Gabe said to me about Washington. What do you think I should do? And he said, well, whatever you do, you got to proceed quietly and carefully because you're going to get a lot of opposition from just about every big wig in Washington, including President Nixon, uh, Bowie Kuhn, who was the baseball commissioner. So he, he treaded carefully for, you know, all the way until spring training until the following um, the early summer when it finally leaked in uh, June of, of 71 that the small town mayor was trying to, to lure the nation's national pastime from the Capitol. And so that summer was a chaotic um, kind of scene of events for him, that's for sure. Uh, so there's, go ahead. And John, I was, I was gonna ask John, like, do you know much about the, the Washington Senators? Like, why were they considered sort of America's home team? And, and, and what was going on there with that club? Well, baseball in Washington going back to 1901 uh, had not been real uh, successful. They'd won a few World Series, but there was always the saying, you know, Washington first in war, first in peace, and last in the American League. And that, and that went back to the 20s and 30s. Um, the original Senators uh, were in a stadium, as Parker knows, called Griffith Stadium in downtown Washington, not a great neighborhood weren't drawing very well in the late 50s. Calvin Griffith and the Griffith family who owned the team uh, moved the team to Minneapolis after the 1960 season with the premise that the American League would keep a team in Washington. So instead of getting guys like Harmon Killebrew and Camilo Pasquale and guys that would form the basis of the 1965 American League champion twins, <laughs> the uh, Washington was left with an expansion team in 1961 of cast off players. And for most of their time in Washington, the, uh, the, nine, the 11 seasons they were there, they, they drew over a million people once. They had one winning record, which was in 1969, which was Ted Williams' first year. Uh, it was certainly one of the sad sack franchises in all of baseball. And like Parker says, the fact that it was in Washington, there was a lot of political pressure that these people didn't come to the games. You know, at, uh, at, our, at, at that point, it was called DC Stadium, later RFK Stadium uh, in Washington. Um, and the owner, Bob Short, did not have a lot of money like, uh, like a lot of Ranger owners over the years. And uh, like Parker said, it was ripe for short to move the team. And he was, a, he was an interested, uh, interested listener in those days. Now, when, uh, when they moved out of Washington that September, the fans rioted the field, didn't they? In the, was uh, it yeah, the last game of the, the last game of the 1971 season in Washington, they were playing the Yankees. They had a lead. I believe it was the ninth inning. Joe yep. Grisenda was on the mound for the Senators. And the fans started to swarm the field and uh, tearing up the bases. The, uh, the umpires could not restore order. So the uh, Washington Senators forfeited their final game uh, as a Washington franchise. And the final score, if you look, is nine to nothing. And then they came here and the, the new name of the team was announced uh, like within a couple weeks, right? Why, why the Texas Rangers? Why do we call them the Texas Rangers? Do we know where that came from? 
I have a, well, John, you might even know more than me on this, but I have, um, from the correspondence I have, I know it was a name that they had, my grandfather and Bob Torette talked about previously, but they actually ran a poll um, a, a, within Arlington residents, and I think it was elsewhere, and I've, I've got it, it's a long list of, I mean, there's hundreds of names where people, um, you know, you kind of vote on what your favorites were. I think they ended up scrapping it towards the end because they were so close to the season um, and ended up going with the name that stuck with them uh, first, Texas Rangers. I could be totally wrong, but I know that the even the uniforms were put together so quickly Washington. that they took senators off the front and put Rangers on it. So you can even see the stitching of the old senators over or underneath the word Rangers. And, and the franchise, again, same thing. It did not have a lot of money. You know, Short, Short sold a lot of his rights. He sold his radio TV rights for 10 years. He sold his advertising program rights for 10 years to the city to try to get revenue to, make the, to, to, to operate the team in those early years. Uh, Ted Williams stayed one year, really was not a Texan at heart. Uh, the story goes, if you talk to the old sports writers, the, the clubhouse at Arlington Stadium, originally the Rangers clubhouse was in center field. So after the game, the players had to walk across the outfield to get to the clubhouse. It wasn't right behind the dugout like it was in later years. And the story goes that Ted Williams, as he would walk off the field, would start taking his jacket off, his jersey off. And by the time he hit the clubhouse, he was pretty much undressed took his shower and was gone before the writers ever got to the clubhouse to interview him after the game. So, and then, and then, then Bob Short hired a Whitey Herzog who went on to become a hall of fame manager. He lasted here one less than one season before, uh, before Bob Short's infatuation with Billy Martin. So, so they got here, they had their first opening day on April 21st. You know, we're filming on April 21st. We're going to air this podcast two days later, but it's April 21st. But um, I'm curious, once they got here, how long did it take before we played any championship baseball, any playoff baseball here? And, and I, I read some stuff about the early years. We went through quite a few managers, too, once they, once they got here before we ever worked on new stadiums? Well, uh, there's a couple of times, and when we were working on the, this ballpark in terms of themes, you know, in terms of themes that you, we wanted to brand for the new ballpark, you know, certainly Judge Vandegrift and Mayor Vandegrift, then Judge Vandegrift, Sarah, was a big part of the story. And, and that, I take that as the 70s. The, the club in 1974 was called the Turnaround Gang. Uh, they won 29 more games than they had the year before under Billy Martin, Ferguson Jenkins, Jim Sunberg was a rookie that year. Uh, 1977, they had four managers in the same season. Eddie Stanky, uh, longtime baseball uh, infielder, uh, came here, took the job, lasted one day, decided he didn't want to move here. So they had four managers here in the period of a, of a week. And really, throughout the 70s and 80s, uh, without – with a few exceptions uh, and things like that, there wasn't a lot to, there were some good years, but uh, there were a lot of very lean years until we got to the 90s. They were the Texas Strangers. A lot of those players then will say, hey, they called us the Texas Strangers. And well, we had a lot of good players. I mean, we went, you know, I mean, Ferguson Jenkins, Ruben Sierra, Juan Gonzalez. I mean, Pudge Rodriguez came on in the 90s, but, you know, Pete O'Brien, Charlie Huff, Kenny Ryan. I and mean, there were a ton of good players that played for these teams, but we were never quite able to get over the hump in those years. So when did we really start growing our audience to the point where it was time to build a new stadium? You know, the, 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 we, we started here with Turnpike Stadium, um, eventually um, was called Arlington Stadium, or is that what the new Paul Park was first called when it was built? Turnpike Stadium was was Arlington Stadium. It was the Turnpike was when it was a minor league park, and they then expanded it once the Rangers came here, and that became known as Arlington Stadium, which then became the ballpark in Arlington, which John knows much more about that endeavor than I do. But uh, yeah, that was the beginnings of that stadium. And when that stadium was built, it was state of the art. I mean, 
best practice in, in baseball, a lot of innovation in stadium design. Can you talk a little bit about that now that it's, you know, the it's, you know I mean, at Arlington Stadium, just going back a little bit, um, it was built originally, I mean, they had the foresight to kind of build it in a bowl that they could expand it, you know, from a minor league ballpark to a major league ballpark. One of the problems- like this too, it was fast. Right. One of the problems was they didn't have a lot of time to make that conversion from the fall of 1971 to April of 1972. So it became, like I mentioned earlier, 20,000 bleacher seats, which again, from a revenue standpoint, and when they added on over the years, but because of the way it was built, you know, and I tell this story all the time, when we had a rain delay, people, there was no place for people to go. There was no real concourse. You know, you basically had to go to your car if we had a rain delay because we just didn't have enough undercover, you know, behind the seating bowl. So, you know, the, the, the ballpark in Arlington was designed uh, during a time when, when retro ballparks, you know, were coming into play. The first one being in Baltimore, you know, Oriole Park at Camden Yards, which opened in 1992. That was the first one to go away from those kind of those round, multi-purpose, cookie cutter type ballparks. And when Tom Schieffer, you know, who, had, who was certainly the, the, the architect and everything and the, and the main force behind the, he, behind the ballpark, he wanted that kind of that retro look, but he wanted it to reflect the state of Texas. Brick, uh, steer heads, lone stars, and that's the, a lot of space, you know, wide open concourses and everything. Um, but, you know, like the, the, those of us that were employees here then, and had worked in Arlington Stadium. And when we, our offices weren't even in Arlington Stadium. They were in an office building, you know, a mile down the street. I mean, we didn't even have offices at the ballpark. So when we made that move uh, to the ballpark in Arlington in the spring of 1994, I mean, we were like, we, we pinched ourselves for two years. We said, we cannot believe that we have this beautiful facility with these type of amenities. Um, and everything like that. Uh, in retrospect, um, you know, should they have put a roof on it? You know, it, it, we might not be standing, you know, in this new park today, but, uh, you know, the ballpark was built for $191 million and uh, it was built on time and on budget and, and we got every, it, it was a beautiful park and really the envy of Major League Baseball. I mean, one thing I thought, um, I think it is neat, maybe to come, I know we kind of we talked about them, you can edit it back, but the, co the coming full circle on the Gene Autry thing, the, thing, the reason why I think it's interesting is because he's really one of the sole reasons why we're here because we needed his vote back in 71 and we got it. And he voted from a hospital bed and the Angels now today are one of our biggest rivals. And so the irony how history kind of came full circle on that for Ranger. Well, and and is isn't, um, hang on, wasn't opening day, Against the Angels. Against the Angels. Yeah. Yeah. And, and at the time, they were like happy together to be playing here in the new stadium. But now, yeah. flash forward. Well, the American League trophy, too, uh, was also when we got that back in 2010 for the first time. And why am I blanking on his wife's name right now? Yeah, his wife. The honorary president of the American League. All right. So she presents the trophy. So she presented the trophy to the Rangers. Yep. You know, little people don't realize that that old Gene Autry connection, the friendship that. And Gene Autry and Nolan Ryan were very close too. Yeah. I mean, we, How did she, they meet? Well, he was owner. He was the owner of the Angels, and Nolan played with the Angels for nine years. So, um, so that's how they knew each other. Well, no. How did Mayor Vandegrift meet Gene Autry? Gene Autry owned the Angels, and so back when. That was kind of the earlier story I told about the Continental League when they were creating that league. The Angels, Arlington, Houston, the Mets, everyone would have been a part of that. And Gene Autry was the owner of the Angels. And so even though Arlington lost out on the team then, he became good friends with Gene Autry. And um, so that's how that relationship started. But it was – Go ahead. Gene was awarded the uh, Los Angeles franchise – the same two teams came in in the American League in 1961. The Los Angeles Angels at the time, 
and the, and the expansion Washington Center. So he got a team the same time the new team moved into Washington. It's a weird kind of – really is kind of a weird – Everyone's connected in some strange way. That's what's kind of fun about it. Well, and it's fun because it's like six degrees of separation from Mayor and, and well, later Judge here, Van de Graaff. Here's another one on that, too. Whenever Houston blocked us from getting a team, instead of sending a team to Arlington, they said, well, let's put a team in Montreal. So that was the first team that went out of the country was to Montreal because they couldn't settle on Arlington. The irony of that, then Montreal then became the Washington Nationals, which now exists today, the replacement team from the Washington Senators. So it is weird. It's just, you could keep the dots connecting all different ways. And so your dad's familiarity and friendships with certain celebrities has been a continued kind of theme through his career. But I want to make sure we get this right. The person who wrote the song, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, was Gene Autry. He was yeah. famous as a singing cowboy in Western movies, but he made all his money from that song, the royalties from that song. And that's how he had the money to buy the angels. Is that right? In, in a fun way of saying it, he made a lot of money through his Hollywood it career, but I mean, certainly it's one of the most recognizable songs anywhere in the world. So it definitely made him a lot of money. That's for sure. Well, it's fun. I mean, he, that song brings people a lot of joy and happiness yeah. and the Rangers have brought people joy and happiness. So, you know, we have Gene Autry to thank for that too. For sure. And so your, your grandfather, after he was mayor, he always still supported the, the Rangers. He was an announcer. Didn't he do announcing for the, for the, for the games? Yeah. He did their color commentating on that TV. Yeah. He, um, and he loved doing it with Dick Reisenhoover. He did it for what, three years, I believe it was. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, he, uh, he loved it. I mean, he was, to him, the Rangers were like his children. I mean, he, I mean, he was just a, a diehard fan. I mean, he wouldn't ever leave a game um, until, you know, the very end. We, I'm probably going to throw a bunch of people under the bus on this, but we were once at a, a, a game with some city officials, and we were getting our tails kicked. And uh, this was a few years before he died. And uh, everyone left, and there was about three of us left. And uh, sure enough, the Rangers came back and won. But he just always said, "I'd never leave a game until the very end." But uh, now he just was—I mean, he was a huge supporter throughout all the years. I and mean, he just—he like I said, he considered the Rangers his family and his kids, really. So when it was time to build the the new ballpark, when he was the county judge, um, John, he was—he had to be involved in that too, right? Because every single one of these stadiums has been a huge undertaking and every one of them wouldn't be possible without it being a public private partnership well, you know, well well judge vandergriff who when i knew him he was judge vandergriff I, he was a real mentor to richard green uh in the years that richard was the mayor in arlington um and had a, and, and and i and i and i contend judge vandergriff had, was a was a very big part of the uh of putting the process together by which they uh they funded uh, the ballpark in Arlington uh, in the early 90s. It was, and you know, he was uh, he was so honored in our second class of Texas of the Texas Rangers Baseball Hall of Fame in 2004. And certainly, most of it was because he was the father of you know professional baseball in Arlington, uh, dating back to the 70s. But uh, his influence lasted uh, long after that. As I, and I said, I think he did have a a big role in us going from Arlington Stadium to the ballpark in Arlington where, you know, I think most of us feel like the club really did arrive. You know, this is so fun. There's, there's so many interesting backstories and celebrity connections and legends and baseball, you know, rock stars. Um, it's kind of the stuff for a Hollywood movie, Parker. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a, it's a great story. I, um, I've, I've always believed it's a, a, a tailor-made movie when you start getting into it in that year in 1971 when everything came to a head and the cast of characters there. Um, it's, there's a lot of, of meat there. And, and just you, th you think of all the characters from Lamar Hunt to Tom Vandergriff to Jim Wright to Ted Williams, all these people who, who collided in this, this story that happened here in Arlington. Um, it's just, it's fascinating. And the impact it had on, on baseball as a whole. So no, I'm going to, I mean, I'm, 
uh, I continued to, to advocate and push um, the efforts to turn this into something much bigger and greater um, than just the story into something on, on film. But uh, no, I, I think it's, it, it's, it is a tailor-made movie, that's for sure. Parker needs to tell one more story, though. He needs to tell the story about when his grandfather hid in Bob Short's office yeah. when David Eisenhower came in. Tell that story. That, that's a classic. Yeah, well, uh, so he, this is one he, he always told. He had a couple he told, but one of them, when he uh, landed, you know, back in D.C., this was in, in the summer of 71, uh, Richard Nixon was irate. I mean, that this, this small-town mayor was trying to, to take – you know, the nation's national pastime from the Capitol. And so when he, he flew in and uh, he got in the back of a cab, I'll tell this story first, he got in the back of a cab and the cab driver was just ranting and raving. I, can you believe this guy from Texas is trying to, to take our team and yada, yada. And my grandfather stayed quiet, didn't say anything. And he kept going and going. And finally, he just admitted, I'm that guy, I'm Tom Vandergriff, I'm that mayor you've been talking about. So the cab, he just slammed on his brakes and kicked him out of the cab. <laughs> and um, so in, in, that, in that same trip, um, David Eisenhower, who was Nixon's son-in-law, uh, kind of got wind that Tom Vanderk was there, these things were going on. So Nixon dispatched him uh, to Bob Short's office to, you know, to talk with Short about, you know, you can't do this. You can't let this move happen. Little did Eisenhower know Tom Vandergriff was there. So when Eisenhower came to the office, Bob Short shoved him into his closet <laughs> and uh, so here, Tom Vanderbilt's there the whole time hiding in a, in a bunch of clothes while Bob Short and D David Eisenhower are kind of going at it um, with about the move to, to Texas. So he, he had just endless stories of all these little things that happened. And uh, it was a fascinating time, that's for sure. That's great stuff. I love it. It's so interesting because um, as long as I've been in Arlington, and that's been in the more recent, you know, 15, 20 year um, history, baseball has been just intri intricately tied to our economy and our culture and, you know, how we celebrate as a community. And um, it hasn't always been that way. So doing, a, doing this history podcast is really informing a lot of people. I'd be interested what you guys would share for any students or young people that might be um, joining us today, where they could learn more about the history of baseball. And then I'd love to kind of shift and talk about the, the new ballpark and what we can see in the future. Well, on the, uh, the history of baseball, um, you can go to texasrangers.com. I'm actually in the process now of trying to consolidate a lot of our artifacts. Um, I'm working on a digital online vault that will have pictures and everything else. Of uh, A lot of it goes back to the senators. Uh, when we moved from Globe Life Park to this new ballpark, they told me, look, you don't have as much space here to collect file cabinets full and boxes full of material. And I'm a pack rat, so I've collected a lot over the years. And so I'm trying to consolidate it now and put it online. Um, but there's some really good references, you know, if you go to texasrangers.com and, and everything and uh, to learn more about baseball in Arlington. It is a fascinating story. I, I would tell kids just to go to a game. I said, go, go to a game, enjoy it. And I mean, that growing up, I mean, that's where my infatuation and my understanding of the game and the history came about because you go and you experience it. And it's, it's a, it's a different kind of game and there's a different kind of fun. And, um, you know, I, I'd say go watch and then absorb and, you know, and, and learn on your own. And certainly the national baseball hall of fame is a place to go if you, haven't been and, and go see that and then certainly the new stadium go look at the walls look at the you know everything the history that's there and um, you know learn and talk to others that's for sure so we don't know when we're going to be able to do that and we all want to be promoting uh, safe social distancing in these times while we're all still trying to stay connected and stay um, social but physically distanced so I'd love John for you to Describe the new ballpark for someone who hasn't seen it or hasn't been inside. Um, some of its attributes and features that we know about the roof, um, but but tell us a little bit more. And then what what is what do you what are you guys thinking about when we are able to come back? How it might be approached? I know that we don't have all the information yet. Right. Um, 
Well, I, I, I kind of equate it to having a Christmas present you can't open. That's kind of the way it feels right now um, when you walk around it and everything. And, you know, it's kind of ironic. The, on March the 11th, we had a, a media open house and then we had a, a public open house for the citizens of Arlington, excuse me, for our season ticket holders. And it was the next day, it was actually that night, that the player for the Utah Jazz tested positive for COVID-19 and the sports world and everything else kind of came to a grinding halt. So we were lucky enough to give people at least a little taste of the ballpark. Um, the roof, obviously, Maggie, is, is, is the main, is the big feature. It's something that, you know, I think people are going to love in here. Uh, having sweated through games at, at the ballpark in Arlington for so many years, it is a, it's going to be a game changer. It's, it's the only one piece roof uh, in a North American stadium, meaning it's one large piece. It moves from east to west. Takes about 15 minutes to, to open and close. And it's kind of fascinating to watch it. The other thing which I think people are really going to enjoy and is going to be, a, is going to, be to me, a very eye-opening when you walk in is how the stadium it looks, how vertical it is. And it's not, and I, and I don't mean steep. I just mean how much you feel like you're on the playing field. Uh, the ballpark in Arlington, the seats were, you know, there was, there was a 35 row uh, seat uh, row upper deck. Uh, there were big seating areas. You were kind of away from the action a little bit. This park is a lot closer to the field the way they've designed it. And I think it's going to be a real uh, home field advantage for the Rangers. I think when the roofs close, it's going to be loud. Um, the, the, and again, it's just seats are much closer. Obviously, we have synthetic grass, but if you looked at it, if you, if, if you guys came in and saw it, you wouldn't think it was turf. I mean, mm -hmm. until you get right down on it and feel it, and uh, some of our players who have been out here a little bit, they can't come out much right now, but they, they, even, even their limited experience, they're, they're saying it's the best field they've ever played on. Um, and again, some of the history, the branding, uh, some of the seating elements, um, the, the 360, being able to, to, to walk around the entire main concourse and be able to see the game as you're walking around it. As you know, it, at the ballpark in Arlington slash Globe Life Park, the concessions were built on the inside of the ballpark. So if you were at a concession stand, you didn't have a view of the field. The new ballpark, you have that 360 where you can walk around 360 degrees around the, both the, the lower, the main concourse and the upper concourse, and you have a view of the field at every, every, every place. So I think it's gonna be a great ballpark for people. Um, I think having a roof and just having the comfort and everything, it, it's gonna be a game changer, but uh, it's, it really is a beautiful park. And your second question, I have no, I, you know, it's, um, a tough question to answer. I, you know, you hear all these um, ideas going around, these concept type things. We don't even call them plans because nothing has come to fruition. Um, yeah. What's there was your, what's one that actually your... came up last night about the Texas plan, where you could have, you know, ten teams come to the to the Texas to to, to North Texas and play in, in these ballparks and everything. But you know, the first. Thing we've got to get through is the health and safety of everybody and be able to do it on a you know a, a safe basis and there's a lot of obstacles to that um, but it's amazing and and you know and again this story has been told a couple times you know this is the third ballpark in Arlington and in all three of the years there has not been a full major league season as we talked about in 90 in 72 the beginning of the season was delayed two weeks because of a player's strike uh, in 94, when we opened the, opened the ballpark in Arlington, the Rangers were averaging 41,000 people a game. Uh, when the season ended uh, in early August because of a player's strike that lasted into 1995. And then this year, we're not going to get a full season in because of the coronavirus. So I don't know what it is. It's something about new ballparks in Arlington and uh, not being able to get a full season in. That's three strikes. I hope not. <laughs> I don't want to be around for the fourth. Let me say that. Well, you know, when when we talk about the early history of the of the Texas Rangers, 
when we were trying to come up with a name for this particular podcast issue, we, we, we used the term uprooted um, because this, this team from its beginning was uprooted. Um, and uh, we're, we're very confident and excited about the day that we can all kind of come back together and celebrate baseball again. And before we started on our call, you two were talking about a statue at the new stadium. Um, tell me a little bit about that statue and its significance. Well, um, you know, in the old stadium, we had, uh, you know, again, one of the, one of the things was, okay, and a lot of ballparks have done this. They've commissioned statues to recognize important people in their history. Uh, 1997, we unveiled statues of Nolan Ryan and Tom Vandergriff that were in, basically in center field inside the ballpark. When we moved over here, we made a decision that, you know, we want those statues to be outside the park. Um, so people can enjoy them, you know, 365 days a year. They make great photo ops. Um, and this way, you know, it's not, they won't, they'll be available not just when there's a game and when people are in the ballpark. So we've put the Nolan Ryan statue in what we're called, what we call Ranger Plaza, which is in the north quadrant of the new park right next to Texas Live. We have, uh, unveil, we unveiled a statue in March of Yvonne Rodriguez that's on the southwest corner, which ironically is home plate, outside the home plate gate, as he, and him as a catcher, that made sense there. And we moved Judge Vandegrift's statue to what, to the, uh, to the northeast entrance, uh, which is going to be a ranger walk. I mean, it's not there yet, but that our, I think our goal long term is to make that kind of a history walk. Uh, in addition to the statue of Judge Vandegrift, uh, there are plaques that honor, there's a plaque honoring Judge Vandegrift. There's a plaque honoring Richard Green, and then there's a plaque honoring Punch Wright, who a lot of people forget about, who was a county commissioner in the 60s and 70s, and was involved in the original building of Turnpike Stadium. So it's very important that we've been able to honor the history of people that came before and are the reasons why we are here today as part of this franchise. And Judge Vandegrift is a huge part of that. We love all the stories you guys have shared today and really appreciate your time on this, on this uh, podcast about the history of baseball in Arlington. Um, anything else you want to share before we wrap up? Actually, I got a personal story I, I, can, I can tell you. I think it might tie in his legacy or just who he was a little bit, but um, we mentioned halfway through this, but back in 2010, when the Rangers went to their very first World Series, which, you know, never been before. It was a dream for him to see World Series ball in Arlington. And um, we were up in the city suite with, with the rest of the, the city officials, and um, the Rangers, you know, Neftali Fully struck out Alex Rodriguez. It was fun, confetti flying down, everything. It was just uh, pure elation, and he was, you know, very excited. And uh, that ended up becoming his last major league uh, game in his last public appearance anywhere. Um, he, we kept him up so late that night that he fell and broke his hip and uh, was in a hospital right afterwards. So he watched the World Series from a hospital bed and then died just a few weeks later. But it's just a, it's neat how, I mean, it's it just poetic and how it, how it ended for him that, you know, his lifelong dream was baseball, you know, finally seeing a World Series here, even though we didn't win. Um, and then that was it. And he went to, you know, play baseball elsewhere. But uh, it was just, that was a neat thing to be a part of just, you know, as his grandson and, and seeing that happen. And we're looking forward to, you know, 2022 will be the 50th anniversary uh, of the Texas Rangers, first year here in Arlington. And uh, we've already started talking about, you know, things we can do to kind of celebrate it. And uh, it's going to be, you know, I think a lot of people, you know, we've done, we did this at 40 years and everything, but it's, it's pretty amazing that it was 50 years ago because of Tom Vandergriff, uh, the Texas Rangers came to Arlington. We can look forward to that. That'll be a very special opening day. Um, good. Well, thank you guys again. And thank, thank you, you for joining us on our Downtown Arlington Roots podcast. And to close our session, here's a few parting words from our mayor. Jeff Williams. It is a great day in Arlington. 
I hope you've enjoyed today's podcast. You can find audio on iTunes and Spotify, and you can find video with supplemental images and video on the Downtown Arlington Facebook and YouTube. Be sure to subscribe and rate this podcast wherever you do listen. And thank you for your interest in the history of Downtown Arlington. On our next episode, we'll be joined by O.K. Carter, author, former Star-Telegram journalist, and the official unofficial Arlington historian, as well as the executive director of the Arlington Historical Society, Geraldine Mills. And we're going to talk about the history of early Arlington. Join us on Facebook Live on Thursdays at four or listen wherever you get your podcasts.